Let me get a recording going so I can record this scan tool information for you guys. And uh, the other thing I'm going to do is taking a quick um, screenshot here and kind of doing a little attendance recording as I kind of get some of our logistics done. All right. Um, so tonight, what we're going to get into is fuel trim and really leveraging fuel trim for diagnostics. But before I do that, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, put it in student view and let's look at what is coming up. What is due uh, uh, soon? Okay. So I'm going to hit my calendar. It's been a bad internet night, so I apologize if my connection is um, a little rough. I'm hoping that the recording will still work out okay. Um, I'm going to switch this over to May, and it's thinking about it, and there it goes. Okay, so... Here we are right here, we're the 29th, tomorrow's the 30th. We have a few pretty small things to do here. Um, and let's let's go ahead and pick those guys apart. So um, the first one is uh, something we were actually talking about last week. It's a uh, custom data list. This, this essentially is like your hands-on assignment. You're gonna take your scanner with your um, uh, you know, car scanner, OBD2 ELM software, and you're going to uh, look at some stuff. You're gonna look to see uh, if there's any data codes. In fact, let's just go ahead and make this big. All right, so you're just mostly sending me some text on here. Um, uh, so you're going to look, Hey, does your car have any, any codes? If it does pull those codes, both pending codes and, and, and regular DTCs. And of course, remember, how do we do that on this tool? It's right here. It's right here on, um, on our app, right? Then we're going to go right next door to freeze frame. And we're going to look at if there is anything there. Then we're going to look at all the sensors and I'm asking you uh, how many different PIDs do you have listed and how many actually have information? Because you're likely to see some PIDs where it lists something, but you can't really get that data because maybe that car doesn't really support that PID in the scan tool. Okay? Um, and then probably the most fun thing of this is you're making a custom data list. Now the custom data list, where, where do you do that on this particular tool? You go to this thing that says live data. And from there, you can select four different items at a time. So like if we have our gray eight, you're gonna unfortunately have to split that up and look at four and four, but uh, pick some of those PIDs that we talked about, those important PIDs and uh, make a custom data list graphing out those four and you can uh uh for that one that's the one thing i want you to do that's actually a screenshot so you'll end up sending me some text and you'll end up sending me one screenshot for this activity okay so um the last thing we have here is uh the data recording icon I want you guys to play around with this data recording icon because that is a um, a good one to use and a good one to to go through. And you know, there's some advantages, disadvantages. What I find with this tool under data recording is I can't do a custom data list data recording. It's recording all the data, which is kind of nice 
But if I have an older protocol, if I have a non-CAM protocol, let's say I'm back on J1850, I lose a lot of resolution because J1850, remember, it's, it's a slower baud rate. And so it's got to pull every single data parameter. It goes to the bottom of the list and then jumps up back to the top of the page and does it again. So what you'll find is data recording on an older car, it's not going to be as smooth as looking at live data on a custom data list. You'll see that refresh rate issue uh, and, the, and the limitations of the baud rate of the computer uh, play out. But still, I want you to do a, a, a data recording just to uh, you know, learn that part of the, of the software. I think it's really big because if, if you're like most technicians where you have a car with a problem and you're working on it by yourself. So you have to drive it and look at the scan data at the same time. Hey, that's not very safe. So if you can, um, it, if you, you know, in doing so, if you can drive the car and just worry, you know, don't worry about looking at the data, record everything, pull over to the side of the road and then review it, that's a much safer way to go. Okay. So the idea with this is to have you. Uh, play around with stuff as you're, um, uh, you know, using the tool and basically run this thing through its various test modes and see what what you can get out of. Okay. Um, so um, anyways, you're going to end up sending me. So if I write this down, you're going to send me uh, some text by answering those questions and you end up with two screenshots. One is uh, the custom data list, and the other one is the recording. So that would be a screenshot of your, your data file or whatever. So anyways, um, hopefully that makes sense. It really will just take a few minutes to do. And this is one that like the data recording, you could get it going you know, on your way to work or something and then, and then review it later. Um, this stuff goes pretty, pretty fast. It's pretty easy. So, um, and that's one of the reasons I like scanners uh, so much is that, um, you know, it makes it, um, makes it nice uh, because, um, you know, scanner stuff is, is easy to do. You're not digging underneath the, the dash. You're not ripping apart the engine. You're just looking at data on your scanner, right? So, I, I like to leverage that a lot because it's it's easy. Okay. Now understanding what it all says isn't necessarily easy, but getting the data, that's pretty easy. All right. Um, so let me clear out these drawings and we're gonna go back to our calendar. And when we're back at our calendar here, um, we'll get down here. So the next thing we're gonna do is this discussion on establishing a condition, okay? And actually that's a lot about our, um, what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, but we've talked about this as we've done our other case studies as well. Um, so I don't have a case study for you tonight because I felt like the lecture was gonna go too long, but we will finish up some case studies uh, in, the, in the future uh, for sure. Um, anyways, uh, this is a discussion and I give you a couple scenarios that just get you thinking like, uh, you know, uh, what would you look at on this on the scan tool? How could you use the scanner to establish a condition uh, for a no start? How can you use the scanner uh, to uh, establish a condition on, uh, you know, with a car that runs rough? So what do I mean by establishing a condition? Well, what direction do I go, right? Is it a spark issue, right? Or is it a fuel issue, right? Maybe it's a compression issue. I need to, I, you know, an engine needs three things to run. It needs heat, fuel, and air, right? The heat comes from spark and it comes from compression, right? So, you know, what do I need? I need, I need the fuel coming in at the right time. I need the spark being delivered at the right time. And I need compression uh, for everything to be, to be happy. Um, so establishing a condition is kind of a fancy way is 
I need to figure out a direction to go on this diagnostic. And so what I want to do is establish a condition as quickly as possible. Um, and then it's in that direction, that condition that then I jump into pinpoint tests. Okay. And scanners are great tools to help you establish a condition between my scanner and usually like my senses, I can establish the condition that I want to go on this, this diagnostic. Okay. So that's a little discussion. And then finally, we have a, a, um, a little thing about uh, communications and diagnostics. So it's a little five question quiz. In fact, let's open this guy up. Okay, so you can take this quiz a couple of times and it's asking you about communication related issues and a couple just generic kind of OBD2 things. And I always like to throw pictures like I, I hate being in a I, I hate reading books without pictures and I certainly hate taking tests without pictures. So I always like to put a picture on there. So look at this picture. It says, hey, you got the wrong communication pro profile. The current profile requires can, which is the really, really fast one at 500 kilobits per second. But your car uses J1850, which is 10.4 kilobits per second. So even on the screen, I'm giving you a few answers here because it tells you a little bit about the different communication protocols and their speeds, okay? So it's a little five question quiz. You can take it a couple times, pretty easy stuff. I bet if you did all, you know, all three of these activities together, uh, probably wouldn't take you more than a half hour of time um, unless you're really new to this stuff or having some technical issue like I've been having tonight, but it should be pretty straightforward. So that is what's due this week. Now, getting back to that assignment on establishing condition, tonight our presentation is about using fuel trim to do just that. Okay, so let me, um, let me go back to our home screen here. And then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna change this to a new share, I think. I'm gonna change this to a new share. And on this new share, we're gonna look up our uh, scanner presentation. Okay. So, let's see. There it is. All right, let's see if we can clean this up a little bit. All right. Scan tool and fuel trim diagnostics. I have her using the fuel trim to direct your diagnosis. And so, um, you know, with that, like what you'll notice is I have on the screen right here is I have a great example of a, um, you know, looking at some scan data here that, uh, it is you know all about that custom data list. I'm looking at four PIDs here uh, with my short-term and long-term fuel trim for bank one. I like to see the engine RPM so I know what I'm doing with the speed of the engine. Um, and you can see that you know there's uh, long-term fuel trim for brake two really didn't change that entire time. Um, if you're not um, if you're not familiar with with looking at the graph data. You're always going to get a graph trace, but the scanner also is going to display where are you at as far as your cursor. So here's here's my um, let's see where is my 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 engine speed is at. So my cursor for this is right here at the at the beginning. So it's showing my fuel trim. Um, at you know negative uh, six percent. So right there, you can see it's just at negative 6.25, negative 6.25, my engine speed. Um, so anyways, it does put the numbers down at the top in addition to graphing it out on the screen. Okay, front door, back door, we've been killing you with that, right? 
um, pinpoint tests are going to be on the front door. Our sensors are on the front door. Um, uh, we, I keep hitting you up with this eight step diagnostic process. And of course, hey, the scanner, it does not replace your knowledge. You need your knowledge to know how to use the scanner and the maximize the most of it, right? And of course, we've been talking about how scanners are directional tools. Well, that's what we're doing. When we're establishing a condition, we're trying to give ourselves that diagnostic direction so then we can pinpoint test where we need to go. And we're not spending hours trying to pinpoint test completely the wrong stuff, right? I don't want to spend hours pinpoint testing a crankshaft position sensor uh, issue when there's nothing wrong with that and the problem's really my fuel pump, right? Okay. Um, so we've looked at this before. We've gone over and over codes, right? OBD2 uses this alphanumeric code system. What that means is a P0 code, the zero means that it's an OBD2 generic code, right? So a P0171 means the same thing on a Toyota, a Ford, a Chevy, a Volvo, whatever, right? Well, what does that mean? Well, it's a fuel and air metering code, right? This is a fuel code. So what is a P0171? Well, he is a code for system two lean bank one. So here's our fuel codes. We have, hey, you have a fuel trim issue. I don't know what it is, right? Then we can kind of um, dive, it, dive it down. Either it's too lean or it's too rich, right? And then of course you got the same thing for bank two, right? If you had a V engine, it's got a bank on each side um, and I've even had four cylinder engines like little RAV fours. It's a four cylinder engine, but the way the exhaust is configured, they'll have one O2 sensor for two cylinders and another O2 or air fuel ratio sensor for the other two cylinders. Okay. So they're trimming out two banks of fuel control on that thing. So anyways, typically a bank one bank two though, is going to be for a V type engine where there's two sides of the engine. Um, so if I have a P0171, yeah, that means I'm running too lean, right? So, um, you know, this is a code by its nature kind of establishes a condition for me, right? Um, the system's too lean. Now, remember that the command is always opposite the condition. So if the O2 sensor says, hey, man, you're lean, the computer's response is going to be, okay, go rich. Okay. So for it to set that code, a 171, what that means is the O2 sensor keeps saying, hey, man, you're lean, go rich. The computer keeps trying to go rich and it goes richer and richer and richer. And the O2 sensor is not happy with it. And it says, no, you're just too darn lean. And if we get too far askew, Boom, then we're going to set this code. All right. So this brings us in back to open, loose, clo open loop, closed loop. Okay. Don't forget that open loop, basically, we're just running off of our parameters that are programmed into the computer, factory programmed calculations. When we go into closed loop, now we're going to modify those factory calculations, right? So this is open loop, factory programming. Closed loop modifies those factory calculations based on either the O2 sensors or the air fuel ratio sensors. In both cases, it's going to be sensor number one. So it's bank one sensor one or bank two sensor one. It's the sensors before the catalytic converters, okay? So now when we're in closed loop, we're fine tuning, right? We're tuning what we're doing and modifying what's programmed in the computer based upon what this guy says, okay? So you can see that, it, you know, there's a lot of, lot of faith in that sensor. Okay, which gives us to, well, what's, what's programmed into the computer? Well, one of the things that's going to be programmed in that's related to fuel trim is the fuel map, okay? So here we're looking at a target fuel map 
of these are the air fuel ratio sense uh, readings we want at various loads. So you can see that like, this is our economy range where we're running a stoichiometric air fuel ratio. Okay, you can see at idle, low speeds, we're um, you know running a little bit uh, uh, richer than that. And then of course you know if you get real high load. Uh, we're getting way rich, um, you know, and you can kind of see where's your economy range and stuff of, of the computer, right? So there's got to be tables programmed in the computer based upon engine load and engine speed where how much on time are we going to give these fuel injectors, okay? Okay, remember, this is what's programmed into the computer. And realistically it's going to look something maybe more like this where here's your idle range cruise acceleration wide open throttle right d cell would be down here but it's all about speed and load now look at here how am i getting my load from my map sensor okay and of course you do have some zones that kind of line up with what you saw here that don't get used a whole lot so when we talk about fuel trim, it's like, this is what's programmed in the computer. And then are we modifying what's programmed in right here based upon what the oxygen sensor or air fuel ratio sensor is telling us? So here's a simplified fuel map I put together and I didn't worry about filling out all the cells, okay? The idea is that, you know, at 2000 RPM at let's say, what's my load maybe, Maybe this is a 10% load. So I'll go over here and I'll write 10%, okay? At that speed and at that load, I have nine milliseconds of injector on time, okay? If I go up in speed and a little bit of load, now I'm at 13 milliseconds. Um, over here, I'm at 20 milliseconds. Of course, if my speed and load keeps going up, I'm gonna have to keep, you know, adding fuel. What you do find as you get to real high RPM is notice that it goes back down. We went from like wide open throttle maximum load at 4,000 RPM where I had 36 milliseconds of injector on time. I dropped back down a little bit at 5,000 RPM and you go, well, why is that? Well. As the engine speed increases, it's harder to get air in the engine. So the load actually goes down on the engine as the speed increases when you get to the far extremes, because at some point you just can't get enough air in the engine to completely fill the cylinders. Anyways, don't worry about that. Let's say we are right here cruising down the road at 11 milliseconds of on time, okay? But the oxygen sensor says, hey man, you're too lean. What's the computer going to do? Well, it's going to go rich. So the computer's going to say, okay, that's not good enough. So now I'm going to go to 12 milliseconds of injector on time. Let's see how that is. So it tries that out for a while and everything's looking pretty good. Um, but you know, Maybe that's all I needed. But if the O2 sensor says, hey, you're still too lean, I tried 12 milliseconds. Well, then I would have to get that out of there and I'd have to try again, right? I have to go, okay, now I'm gonna go to 14 milliseconds of injector on time. I'm gonna keep those fuel injectors open up that much longer. And what's the O2 sensor say now, right? So what we're talking about with fuel trim is we're talking about modifying the values in the fuel map based upon what the oxygen sensors or air fuel ratio sensors are telling us. And you can see how each one of these is a different cell, right? You're at a different speed, right? So here's a thousand RPM and we're at different loads. So maybe that's 5% load. Maybe this is 50% load, right? I just kind of made up this chart. But 
The idea is that there's all these different cells that is a combination of engine speed and engine load and programmed into that is basically, okay, well, how much fuel do you give to the engine? In open loop, we're basically running off of our computer sensors and inputs, and we're just, you know, running off of what's, what's on the table. When we're in closed loop, I'm gonna put CL for closed loop. Now we're modifying this table based upon what the O2 sensor or the air fuel ratio sensor is telling us, okay? All right, nope. So uh, remember from last week, we talked about oxygen sensors and we said, hey, um, remember that uh, a high voltage, which is 900 millivolts or 0.9 volts is like a rich signal a 0.1 or 100 millivolts is a, um, it's a lean signal. So what that means is if I have a lean, think of, I'm gonna type it out, lean equals low. So lean equals low. So if if I'm low, I, my O2 sensor is saying, hey dude, you're lean, what's the computer gonna say? The command is going to be, hey, go rich, right? So it measures the difference between the outside oxygen and the oxygen in the exhaust. And from that, it can produce a voltage. Usually the maximum it can produce is 1.2 volts on most of your oxygen sensors. There's a few oddballs out there, right? Well, um, what we didn't talk about is air fuel ratio sensors. And I kept throwing that term out there. And the reason is, is starting in the early, well, really the late 90s, some manufacturers even like the early 90s, but let's say the late 90s, we started seeing air fuel ratio sensors used on our car. And as we moved into the 2000s, they're getting you know pretty commonplace. Now, what's confusing is air fuel ratio sensors, they can have two, uh, they can be a four wire sensor. They can be a five wire sensor, a six wire sensor. But I'll tell you the ones that are four wire sensors, it's really hard to tell their diff the difference between how they look and, and a regular oxygen sensor when it's screwed into the exhaust. If you take it apart, a lot of times the tip of the sensor element looks a little different. This is an oxygen sensor. The one on the screen is an air fuel ratio sensor. Okay, But of course, I can't see this part when it's in my car. So it's really hard to tell. So, you know, you, you figure it out from looking at your service information, looking at your scan data, because the, the data oftentimes will look different from the air fuel ratio sensor. Um, so anyways, they're, they're pretty commonplace. They are going to be used before the catalytic converter. They're the upstream sensors. So this is a, another good OBD2 term for us. Upstream is your sensor before the cat. Downstream is your O2 sensors that are after the cat. So we wouldn't really use air fuel ratio sensors after the catalytic converter. We use them before the catalytic converter, okay? Now, remember a regular oxygen sensor ran at 600 degrees. Notice that these guys, they run at 1200 degrees, okay? They run smoking hot and they take a lot of current, a lot of amps of current to uh, flow through their heater elements to get them to warm up to that 1200 degrees quickly. And so what I have found is that air fuel ratio sensors oftentimes have a greater fail record than a regular oxygen sensor. Meaning that I find that these sensors oftentimes will fail faster than a regular oxygen sensor. Now, why is that? Well, I think it just comes down to heat these things are running smoking hot. They're working hard all the time, okay? And they kind of burn themselves out much like a light bulb, okay? Remember that all oxygen sensors eventually go dead. They're, they're much like a little battery. And as a battery goes dead, so do these sensors. Now, keep in mind, like we're a regular oxygen sensor, lean is low. So when the battery goes dead, it goes low. It tells the computer, hey, man, you're you're running you're running lean and the computer is going to default to riching up the mixture and that is definitely 
a serious concern. So um, air fuel ratio sensors, they're kind of like, it's kind of like an O2 sensor within an O2 sensor, okay? Again, this one, um, this looks like a Honda, maybe it's, it's a five wire sensor, like the Toyotas are four wire sensors. It's really hard to tell just by looking at the sensor. You really got to look up the service information to figure it out, okay? But it's got chambers within chambers with the diffusion chamber, a reference chamber. And like I said, it's really like two O2 sensors in one unit. In fact, this would be the like a wiring schematic for a five wire Honda style air fuel ratio sensor that's based off zirconia elements. So notice it's got a big heavy duty heater control in there. And then we have like an O2 sensor input one and an O2 sensor input two uh, on there. And again, it's a sensor within a sensor uh, and the computer's monitoring, it's actually monitoring uh, current flow from this assembly, although it may be displaying voltage on your scan tool. They're kind of weird uh, to work with. Air fuel ratio sensors are not one that gives you a good signal with your voltmeter. So one of the things with air fuel ratio sensors is you're really relying a lot more on your scanner. And it's one of these things where if the if it's coding up, right? If, if it's coding up, you're pulling up pending codes and, and regular DTCs for air fuel ratio sensors and you have a power, you know, you have a good signal here with power and ground from your O2 sensor heater and um, the ground. And so basically the wiring is good. Well, guess what? If the wiring's good, your sensor's got to be bad, right? And as long as there's no exhaust leaks or anything weird, if it's coating up, you know, and the wiring is good, it's most likely your sensor. That's the most common failure because they just burn themselves out. Anyways, I figured I'd talk a little bit about how those guys work. Okay, back to the fuel map. Um, again, we looked at like, okay, this would be idles down here, low speeds, low loads, all the way up to wide open throttle, right? Um, it's not too often where you're at low load and you're revving it up to wide open throttle. But you know, like as I guess if you're just, you got it in park and you just put, put mash your foot to the floor, well then you'd be over here, but this is your normal range where you're driving around, right? Um, what's programmed into the actual fuel map? If you guys actually get to do this, um, really we, we use VE or volumetric efficiency. And what we work with actually looks something like this, okay? Um, so this is a picture, this is hull tech. And if you take the engine uh, testing and tuning, right now it's uh, number AT325. If you're into this type of stuff and you wanna program the fuel maps on cars and stuff, that's some of the stuff that we, we do in that class, okay? So again, you can see it's RPM, and then it's load off, off of um, pressure. So it's always speed and load. Okay, so the fuel map modified, when I made this thing, I said, okay, well, we're talking about milliseconds of on time, right? Because that's something we can relate to. How long do I keep the fuel injectors turned on, spraying fuel inside my motor, okay? but you don't really program in how many milliseconds of on time you, you have. What you really do is you, you look at your engine efficiency or your volumetric efficiency. That's the numbers that you plug in here, okay? So here we can see there's 100% volumetric efficient, efficiency. There I'm down to 65. And so based upon that efficiency number, then the software then calculates how much on time that would be, okay? This screenshot is from a MoTeC uh, engine management system. MoTeC and Haltech to me are like the two standards. So I guess we got to tell what what tell you what volumetric efficiency is. Well, volumetric efficiency is how efficient am I at completely filling 
the cylinder and combustion chamber with air on the intake stroke. So it's the displacement of the engine compared to the actual amount of air that goes into it. So if I had a Chevy 350, that's a 5.7 liter engine. If I was running 100% volumetric efficiency, I would fill this thing with 5.7 liters of air when it went on the intake stroke, okay? Um, so for example, in this picture, we have, I don't know, I think that looks like 80 cubic inches of air enter the cylinder. The cylinder volume is 100 cubic inches. So I'm basically at 80% volumetric efficiency. Okay, so it's how much air can I get in the motor, right? And, and in the performance class, in the tuner class, I always like to talk about, like most all of our engine modifications, high flow air filter, better exhaust, putting a turbo on a car, they're all aimed at trying to improve volumetric efficiency, okay? And that happens to be what we are programming into the computer if you actually do some EFI tuning, the numbers that you're typing in are VE numbers but they're gonna to correspond to injector on time, okay? Now keep in mind, that's gonna be modified based on what the O2 sensor or air fuel ratio sensor tells the computer, okay? Again, this is some displacement calculations related to volumetric efficiency. Um, and uh, you can see on this screen here, they talk about, uh, you know, fuel closed loop control trim, right? Percentage of trim here. So even in an aftermarket computer where you're programming up these tables yourself, you know, there is the ability to go in a closed loop and modify what you programmed based upon what the oxygen sensors are telling us, okay? So what is fuel trim then? Fuel trim, is displayed as a percentage, think of it as the percentage or the amount of correction. If the computer is having to add too much fuel or take too much away, something's wrong. Assuming that the, assuming that whoever programmed the fuel table did a good job. What I'll see in school is I'll have students program these tables and they'll do a, a really lousy job and it's having to do a ton of fuel trim because they did not program the tables correctly, right? But you gotta figure the, the engineers at GM or Ford or Toyota, Honda, Mazda, they should know what they're doing. And so if they did a good job programming those tables, we really shouldn't have huge changes on fuel trim, right? So plus or minus 10% is considered to be normal, okay? Now, uh, one of the questions that I've gotten in the past is, hey, this fuel trim thing is really cool. Did it start with OBD2? Actually, no, it didn't. Remember I said that your old GM OBD1 system served as a lot of the base platform for OBD2 because GM's self-diagnostic system, onboard diagnostic system was way better than everybody else's back in the 80s. Um, GM actually had a fuel trim uh, deal, okay? They have what they called integrator and block learn, okay? There was 256 bits in those old processors. And so they split it in half and they said, okay, 128 is where we wanna be. So essentially like 128 was your 0% fuel trim, no correction, okay? And then the number could go up and down from there. So with OBD2, they said, hey, let's standardize this thing for all the manufacturers so you know how much the computer is having to correct from its base programming. And from there, you can figure out a lot of what's going on. You can really establish a condition. Am I running rich or am I running lean? Um, so zero to 10%. So if I look at this guy, the short term here, he only, he goes up to like two and a half percent. The long term, uh, goes minus 6.25%. Um, you know, all those things are in the normal range. Nothing's jumping out at me from this, what's on this scanner screen of fuel trim being way off. Right. 
In fact, one guy's going a little bit positive with the short term, the long term's going a little bit negative. And where are we actually trending? Uh, really, where we end up subtracting those two out and we're taking away maybe three, four percent. So a smidge of fuel. That's not too bad for a vehicle that this scanner shot was off of a vehicle that has 230,000 miles on the clock. So not too shabby. Now you might go, well, wait a minute, what happened here? Um, it, it went from zero and it went up to 0 0.5. Then man, it jumped up over three. The long term went from, you know, almost like five and a half, five point six, all the way down to um, uh, negative six, and then went back up. Like, what's causing it to jump up and down, right? Because um, you'll see that a lot of times fuel trim. Like, if you're holding the engine speed and load steady, if it's just idling, or you're just revving it up to two thousand RPM and holding it there perfectly, you won't see big changes in the fuel trim. However, if I go back to these tables, where you see fuel trim kind of jump around on you is if you're jumping from cell to cell, because it's how much do I have to trim each cell? So if I'm driving it and then I rev up the engine and I go from this cell, boom, to this cell, right? Well, there's a trim for this guy and there's another trim for that guy, okay? And there's another trim for this guy. So if you're driving the car in such a way where you're changing the speed and changing the load, you're jumping from cell to cell to cell to cell, each cell can have a different trimmed number and that's where you'll see field trim kind of jump around, okay? Again, though, even when it's jumping around, it really shouldn't be changing much more than plus or minus 10%. The short term usually will change a little bit more, change a little faster, and then the long term will, sl will slowly follow it, okay? All right, so now you guys know what field trim is, you know what volumetric efficiency is, and hopefully it's starting to make some sense and come together, okay? Remember the best way for you guys to see this stuff would be to click right here and use your data record feature, okay? What you can do is click this box at the top here and then it's always recording the data as long as before you shut the car off, you go in and you say disconnect, okay? If you don't do that, then you'll lose the data, okay? So a great way to see these things, especially if you have a newer car that's running a controller area network, so it's higher speed, um, you'll get pretty good resolution out of that. And so you do that data recording, which is, you know, like part of one of our assignments this week, so. Okay, so let's say you're setting some fuel trim codes or the fuel trim, maybe you're not setting a fuel trim code, um, but you're trying to use fuel trim to establish a condition, okay? The first question you have to ask if you're, if you're gonna pay attention to fuel trim is remember fuel trim is the amount of correction based on what? Based on what the O2 sensor is telling the computer, right? So it's based on the O2 sensor or air fuel ratio sensor. So the first question you guys always have to ask yourselves then if you're doing fuel trim stuff can I believe the O2 sensor or air fuel ratio sensor? Is it believable, right? If this sensor is dead, maybe I can't believe it, right? So how do I figure that out? Remember with O2 sensors, they should always, you know, they should, they should go to like one volt when it's rich and they should go to zero volts when it's lean. So what could I do? Well, I could manually make it lean. I could pull some vacuum lines and force the engine to go lean. I could spray some carburetor cleaner in the intake and manually make it go rich. Or I could like snap the throttle. It's always going to default to, to rich when you snap the throttle and see, can I force the O2 sensor to switch between rich and lean, okay? Um, and from that, you can kind of determine, well, do I believe these O2 sensors or not? Air fuel ratio sensors are much harder. Usually on a car with an air fuel ratio sensor, if I have fuel trim codes and air fuel ratio sensor codes, um, it's probably an air fuel ratio sensor. But what we'll do is we'll test some other things. For instance, if I'm setting that P0, uh, the 171 code, where it's saying, hey, that system is lean, 
Well, remember that, you know, lean is low. And so that would be the way a lot of these things would default when they, when they fail. Right. So, um, you know, I would want to make sure that there's no reason for the engine to run lean, like it's got good fuel pressure, right? The fuel pressure is where it's supposed to be. That's important, right? So um, if the fuel pressure is too high, it, which doesn't happen too often, but if the fuel pressure is too high, of course, that's going to make it run rich. Or if the fuel pump's starting to crap out or it's got a restrictive fuel a filter and now the fuel pressure is dropping, that's, of course, going to make the engine run lean. So I could have a faulty fuel pump setting a lean code. So one thing that I've seen happen lots of times is I'll have an O2 sensor code. I'll get a code for a defective oxygen sensor. I'll get a P0171 and I'll see a guy go in and he goes, oh, well, I got an O2 sensor code. I'll throw an O2 sensor on it. It's like, wait a minute. If you got an O2 sensor code and a lean code, I bet something's actually making the engine run lean. So that could be, again, a fuel pump that's starting to crap out, right? So, um, if you believe that the air fuel ratio sensor or O2 sensor is not lying to you, like you forced it rich, you forced the engine rich, you force it lean, that sensor seems to respond, then you can say, okay, I believe it. And now I start doing some other pinpoint tests, like what's the fuel pressure, right? So if I have a, if I have a code where it says, hey, you're running lean, well, that could be low fuel pressure. That could be vacuum leaks, right? That could also be a, a contaminated mass airflow sensor, or it could be a map, although maps aren't as common. Um, so that could be, you know, some of those issues, you know, and there's there's other things that will affect you, like on on uh, cars with map sensors, if the exhaust is restricted, other things you'll get rich running codes. Okay, so um, anyways. Uh, you know, it, it points you into some more pinpoint tests. Now, speaking about the mass airflow sensor and some pinpoint tests, I have something else that's special that I want to show you that relates back to volumetric efficiency, okay? So let's say we have this code, P0171. And we determine that we believe the O2 sensors or air fuel ratio sensors, they're not lying to us, okay? What we're, we're you know, we're, we're getting that code and we look at the, the bank too, it's, it, it's fuel trims out of whack as well. We believe that the sensors aren't lying to us. Well, there's a way that I can see if I have a mass airflow sensor issue, okay? Which until we kind of develop this diagnostic it was it was often hard to tell okay so volumetric efficiency remember it's how well do we fill the engine with air fuel mixture on the intake stroke most cars today usually have an 80 90 80 to 90 percent volumetric efficiency okay meaning that at wide open throttle, so you got to get out there and drive it and go wide open for a few seconds, um, they'll get to about 85% or so volumetric efficiency. I have here NA, that's naturally aspirated. Obviously, if your car is turbocharged, and a lot of cars are turbocharged these days, you can get over 100% volumetric efficiency. You might be going up to 120% VE because of that turbo. Okay, so we can calculate the VE with our generic scan tool. So yes, you could take your basic OBD2 interface here for that you bought for 20 bucks or whatever and our software and we can use that to calculate what is the volumetric efficiency of this engine. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's even kind of cool if I relate this to the performance side is like you could do this test with your car, then you could put on a high flow exhaust system or a different air intake and you could do the test again to see am I actually getting more air flowing through my engine now, okay? Almost like a poor man's dyno, if you will. Um, 
And of course, you know, our little scan tool actually has acceleration tests too. So you could, you could do both of those things. All right. So it requires you to use a VE calculator, but don't worry. These calculators are online and they only require a generic scan tool to make them work. So here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to this. Uh, I'm going to go to that, that uh, calculator there. And actually, I have it on the slide, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my screen share. And I'm going to go back to the internet because I did put this guy in your class. So if I go to modules, I have the, I have the website linked right on there. And um, I go to modules and I know like we're getting a little bit ahead of things, but I'll tell you why here in a minute. Um, uh, you can see there's volumetric efficiency presentation. So I threw in a couple presentations all about what these are. These are from Bosch, but they're about what we've been talking about. Air fuel ratio sensors, volumetric efficiency, because I felt like these were two of the most complicated things we talk about all semester. Okay. But here is the link. Volumetric efficiency calculator. I'll just click the top to get it to open up. And here is that web link. So it's OTC's website. And what do I need to know? Okay. Uh, what I need to know is I need to know what my uh, intake air temperature sensor is. I need to know my engine RPM. And by the way, most cars with a mass airflow sensor, they have the intake air temperature sensor. Oftentimes it's located within the mass airflow. Okay, so, um, so I need to know the intake air temperature. I need to know the engine RPM and I need to know the mass airflow in grams per second. And then I need to know my engine displacement. So what is that displacement? You know, is it uh, 5.7 liters, right? You would look this up in your service information or maybe the underhood label. Oops, something like that. Let me get back to the internet. Um, so anyways, um, you put that thing in there and it will do your calculation. So I'm just going to throw in some numbers. Now, actually, before I do that, though, what I should do is get my drawing tool back up and say, read the instructions here. Okay. So performing a volumetric efficiency test can reveal the accuracy of the mass airflow sensor. Okay. Also can point out potential issues with the engine. Um, one in particular would be like a restricted exhaust system. Okay. So what do we do? We go to wide open throttle during our road test. So I'll put it in data record mode because I don't want to be looking at a scanner screen as I'm going to wide open throttle out on the highway. Right. So I'm going to go to wide open throttle and I'm going to record my data during that time. And these would be the PIDs that are major important to me. What's the engine RPM? What's the intake air temperature? And what's the mass airflow in grams per second? Okay. So I look at the highest amount of RPM on my data recording where I was at wide open throttle. Okay. And I start putting that stuff into the calculator. So let me clear out these drawings. We'll get our text tool. Uh, we'll get our mouse going again. So let's say my air temperature, it gets pretty warm underneath that hood. And let's say it was at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I was running this thing up to 5,500 RPM. And uh, I don't know, I had, um, let's say 50, grams per second of air flowing into the engine. Um, and this engine is a two liter engine. You can see, oh God, that would be, that would be pretty dismal. That'd be pretty terrible, right? Now, okay, let's go. All right, so that's a, that's a more normal reading. So 
it basically is a way for you to see well, what's normal. Now, remember, most every modern engine is going to have a minimum of about 80% volumetric efficiency. And you can kind of look at the engine and see how efficient it is. If I have a dual overhead cam engine, right? Something like a Honda or, toy, you know, that, that engine's going to be more efficient. It's going to be 85, 90%. If I have an old, you know, Chevy pickup truck, yeah, maybe it's only like 80%, okay? Um, if I have something from, well, something from the 70s wouldn't give you this data, right? So it's, you know, OBD2 or, or newer, right? So, you know, 80% would be kind of like my minimum threshold. And you can kind of go from there. If it's overhead cam and it's a well-designed car, right? I would expect this volumetric efficiency to be higher. If it's something that's turbocharged, I would expect it to go over 100% volumetric efficiency, okay? So hopefully, uh, hopefully that makes, makes some sense, right? This says 75 to 90%. Like I said, really, I, I find it's more like, like 80 to maybe 95 on, on some stuff. Like if you tested a, uh, uh, a modern, an ND Miata, like revved up, man, that thing will be close to 95%. So, um, all right. Uh, it says diesel and turbocharged engines, higher than 95%. Um, it even gives you a little video on how to do it. Um, pretty darn cool, okay? So the volume metric efficiency calculator uh, let you know your engine's efficiency. But the major input factor to that, as you guys saw, is how many grams per second is the mass airflow sensor reporting to us? All right, well, let's go back to our presentation. And so here's what we can, what, what, here's my tips for you guys. If the exhaust is good, most likely it's a contaminated mass airflow sensor, okay? Why? Because what can really screw you up on this test is maybe your volumetric efficiency is really low. What would cause your VE to be really low? The most common thing would be a restricted exhaust system. So you could you know, check out the catalytic converter. Is it starting to break down? You could do an exhaust back pressure test. You could put a vacuum gauge on the car and, uh, and, and do that test. So I would definitely, before I condemn the mass airflow sensor, I would check the exhaust system and make sure I do not have a restricted exhaust, okay? If the exhaust, at the very least I get underneath the car and I beat on the catalytic converter and the muffler to see if it if it rattled, if it made noise. If the exhaust system rattles when you beat on it, right? Well, that tells you your catalytic converter is breaking apart. And yeah, you probably got a restricted exhaust. But if I beat on the exhaust and it sounds solid, the most likely cause is a contaminated mass airflow sensor. And I say, hey, always watch these k &N style or washable air filters because the oil from that filter will go down the airstream and it will contaminate the mass airflow sensor. Now, they have cleaners for this. I have on here only use the right cleaners. Why? Because if you spray on some carb cleaner or brake cleaner, you're likely going to destroy the element of that sensor. Those cleaners are too caustic. They're too corrosive to, um, to uh, you know, give you good... Um, give you good data there, okay? Uh, or not, they're too corrosive to, to, to work properly. They'll wipe out your sensor, I guess is what I'm getting to. And that I have used that by mistake. And it's like, well, it's the only thing I have. Brake cleaner shouldn't kill it. And that ended up wiping out the sensor a few weeks later, okay? So this volumetric efficiency calculator is a great way to diagnose a contaminated mass airflow sensor. And that's a pretty common um, problem these days. Even if you're not running a can and air filter, if you if you got a Toyota that's setting lean fuel trim codes, really suspect of the mass airflow, okay? All right. Um, so what are our conclusions here? 
Okay. Again, just like last week, you want to leverage as much as you can from whatever scan tool you have. So if we're using this, we have a generic OBD2 scan tool. I want to leverage every feature of that thing, right? Looking at codes, looking at pending codes, looking at the freeze frame, okay? Custom data lists that are tailored to my code. So if my code is related to fuel trim, fuel trim is going to be up and my O2 sensors are up in that custom data list. I'm going to be using that data record function, okay? Use your O2 sensors and fuel trim to establish a condition, okay? And part of this could be you manually drive it rich by shooting some carburetor cleaner down the intake. You manually drive it lean by pulling vacuum lines and see what the engine does, okay? The VE calculators, like I've shown you, can be very useful, especially for things like a contaminated mass airflow sensor, picking out a restricted exhaust, and ultimately, what I want you guys to get out of this class is that, hey, scanners are nice tools to have. And quite frankly, you need to need to have it for diagnostics on a modern vehicle, but you're, you're the best diagnostic tool there is, right? In that you could have a $5,000 super special professional scan tool. If you're using it only as a code reader, well, you're not getting your most out of it, right? I'd be better off using this $20 tool in applying my big brain here to uh, diagnose that car. I would get farther with that, okay? So hopefully hopefully that makes sense to you. We'll revisit this um, conversation um, <clears throat> about the um, volumetric efficiency calculator and fuel trim. All right. Okay, so with this, um, I'm going to change my screen share one more time. I'm going to go back <clears throat> to the internet. <laughs> and I'm going to, and I just, I'm just closing up some, some stuff. Okay, so I'm back on the internet and I'm going to go back to our class. I'm back to the calendar. Remember what's due this week is doing some codes and screenshots and stuff on our scan tool. Um, our little quiz on communications and we talked about communications some stuff last week and the week before. Um, and then this thing on establishing a condition. So, um, you know, Again, if I, um, you know, I could use fuel trim, a fuel trim is a big one to establish a condition, right? If the computer's having to add a bunch of fuel, if the fuel trim numbers are positive, that means it's adding fuel. That means that, you know, if the O2 sensor is not lying to us, that means the engine's running too lean, right? So I, I've established a condition. I have a lean condition. <clears throat> if the computer is taking fuel away, if the fuel trim numbers are negative, that means that we're taking a bunch of fuel away. So something's causing the engine to run too rich. Maybe I have a, a fuel pressure regulator diaphragm that ruptured or, or something like that, okay? Uh, I've even seen it where somebody, um, they put the wrong, fuel, they, you know, they replace the injectors and they put the wrong ones in there. Um, so uh, something's causing it to run too, too rich. Um, so fuel trim is a great um, is a great indicator to tell you, hey, am I running rich? Do I have a rich condition, or do I have a lean condition? As long as you can believe what the O2 sensors are telling you. Okay. Now you got other um, other conditions and stuff from from there. Um, let me go back to our course and. I wanted to show you that I have been adding in our presentations. So if I go to modules and I go down to the bottom, kind of where we're at, um, I have, you know, different modes of OBD2, getting the most data. Let's, let's throw up this one with the different modes of OBD2 real quick. Thinking about establishing a condition with your scan tool the different modes of OBD2, if I could leverage those, that would be pretty sweet. Again, it's a bad computer night, so I'm gonna 
Oh, that's my that's my web link of my modes of OBD2. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and go to it. I also have my presentation there. <clears throat> but we talked about how you have data. Let me get my little <clears throat> drawing tool up here. I, I can look at my data, right? I can look at my codes, my freeze frame, right? Uh, information. Um, so we talked about permanent trouble codes. Um, but, you know, let's say for instance, um, <clears throat> I had a no start, right? I can look at this data. One of the things that's really important if a car doesn't start is that it's got a crankshaft position sensor signal, right? So if I have a crankshaft position sensor signal, I should see some RPM on my scan data as I crank over the engine. If I don't have any RPM, I either have a crank sensor malfunction, possibly a cam, or the module in between the crank sensor and the engine, maybe that guy is not relaying that signal to the computer. But, uh, you know, so I can establish a condition based on what kind of RPM signal I have, right? Also, remember that um, OBD2, it's all about emissions there. And one of the things we, we monitor for is misfires, right? So I have a misfire monitor. So if I have an engine that runs rough, I'm going to say, well, does it have codes that related to misfires, right? If I have a P0304, I'm going to say, oh, well, looks like I got a misfire on cylinder four. That would certainly make it run rough. And then I'm going to pinpoint in to what's going on there. So again, the scanner can help me set a direction based on what code it's setting or based on what data it's giving you, you know, whether you're looking at RPM or you're looking at fuel trim, right? I could end up where an engine is misfiring because I'm giving it too much fuel or not enough fuel, right? So if I got misfire codes and also a lean fuel trim code, and I see that the fuel trim is going way positive, maybe I'm just, my mass airflow sensor is so far off, I'm giving it so little fuel that I'm not giving it enough fuel to run correctly, and that's going to cause a misfire, right? So the scanner is really powerful in helping you establish a condition um, there. And so that's that's what I was trying to do with that establish condition assignment is to get you to think about how I can use the scanner maybe in conjunction with other tools to uh, figure out what's going on, right? Like if I had a, that misfire on cylinder four, you know, maybe I would want to look at the spark plug and stuff and maybe I end up doing a compression test on cylinder four, right? Um, what's nice about that is maybe I don't have to compression test all the cylinders. I just go to number four and go, yep, it's got no compression in there. Okay, need, needs a head job or it needs a new engine, right? So it can really help you establish a condition, go down a diagnostic path and figure out what's wrong really quickly. So um, with that, we will uh, switch this back to our, um, we'll get rid of some of those drawings. We'll switch it back to our home screen. I hope you guys got um, something out of that. Uh, again, leverage that fuel trim. It's something that we really didn't have on most cars before OBD2. And it's something that's pretty sweet with OBD2 because you get to see how much is the com how, how much is the computer correcting from what's programmed in there based on uh, what's programmed in the based on the oxygen sensor. All right. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Let me stop the recording.